Berlin, January the 30th, 1933. The Weimar Republic was in its last days. Hitler had just been appointed Chancellor of Germany. In the crowd, despite the freezing cold, a 15-year-old girl, Melita Mashman, was enraptured. The crashing tread of the feet, the somber pomp of the red and black flags, the flickering light from the torches on the faces. I longed to hurl myself into this current, to be submerged and borne along with it. Melita wasn't the only young woman to be enraptured by the new regime. Their names were Hertha, Liesel, Lieselotte, Hildegard. They would be among the hundreds of thousands of women to actively serve the Third Reich. Trained in Nazi ideology, they became secretaries, nurses, concentration camp guards and wives of SS officers. History has forgotten them, but recent academic research has lifted the veil on the involvement of women in criminal Nazi policies. I think they were ordinary women until they found themselves in an extraordinary situation. Societies think of women as nurturers, as caregivers, as mothers, but the history of the Holocaust show us, in fact, they can be socialized to be violent. It really cuts against our perceptions of women and our bias about women and what their behavior should be. We thought they were the passive witnesses of a genocide carried out by men. But we have discovered that these women were indispensable cogs in the works. Their commitment and violence is intriguing. How did they end up as accomplices and in some cases, murderers. Why did post-war justice close its eyes to their crimes? What taboos still prevent us today from acknowledging the violence of these women? No sooner had Hitler come to power the Melita Mashman decided to become part of what she saw as a revolution. Despite her parents forbidding it, she secretly enrolled in the BDM, the girls' branch of the Hitler Youth. It was a way of rebelling against her well-to-do family, which saw the Nazis as a bunch of thugs. Like many of her comrades, Melita had grown to despise her restricted life as a model little girl. In her memoirs, she wrote, At that age, one finds a life which consists of schoolwork, family outings and birthday invitations wretchedly barren of existence. Nobody gives one credit for being interested in more than these derisory trivialities. I needed to free myself from the narrow boundaries of my childhood and attach myself to something grand and essential. Hi, Hitler. The BDM seized upon these hopes. <laughs> the new regime was intent on attracting teenagers to ensure its future. Bitte sprecht mir nach. Ich during 1933, more than 200,000 girls joined the BDM. The girls met up at summer camps, far from their parents, in the great outdoors. 
Nazism was very ingenious. It used educational methods which today might be called innovative because they didn't openly indoctrinate young people, but rather present them with lots of leisure activities which made them feel like they were having fun. Melita and her companions had an unprecedented feeling of freedom. I remember with pleasure the week-long outings, hikes, sports, campfires and youth hosteling. They could play tennis and go horse riding, which for most working-class girls had been unconceivable a few years earlier. Many of them later said they were the happiest days of their life. Of course, that sounds somewhat indecent when you hear that today. Melita, a high school student, met sales clerks, office workers, seamstresses, and domestic employees. The Nazis hoped that this social melting pot would result in a group mentality in which individuality would disappear. And those summer camps always had activities that would uh, encourage you to like trust your comrades, like falling into them. Like we have, you know, these concerts like with mosh pits, like things where you like you give up your your trust and you place it in your in your comrade. <laughs> the Hitler Youth was a powerful indoctrination machine in the service of a profoundly misogynist regime. The Nazis allowed no women to hold responsible or decision-making positions, neither within the party nor the state, when they represented half of the electorate. Many German women were even forced out of the job market. Under the guise of fighting endemic unemployment brought about by the financial crash of 1929, almost a million women were brutally dismissed from their jobs. Several laws were passed shortly after 1933, like the one concerning double salaries for public servants. If both a husband and a wife worked in a public service of some kind, the woman had to quit her job. And it was out of the question that women should go through higher education. The regime established a so-called numerous clausus, which limited at 10% the number of female students in universities. The effect was immediate. In the lecture halls of Münster Law School, you could count the number of young women present on one hand. One of them, Annette Schuking, was from a family of left-wing lawyers. For my mother, it was a very difficult period. There were few female students in universities, and those who did attend were looked down on. My mother was a very gentle, warm and reserved woman, but she wasn't to be underestimated. She was being mocked for, for wanting to pursue a degree in law. She thought she could battle the system from within and become a lawyer or a judge. She really had a kind of plan. I'd even call it a vision. Annette had been shocked by the terrible treatment of a friend of her father, a social democrat member of parliament, who was arrested by the Gestapo and sent to a concentration camp. Like other political opponents, he was humiliated and tortured there. So she thought to herself, what can I do for human rights? I don't want this kind of thing to happen, for people to be treated in this way. Annette didn't state her hopes for democracy openly. 
But despite not being in the regime's sights, she was heading into a brick wall. She had the best scores, the best uh, grades. But they said, no, you, you know, you're a woman. You can never practice law. You can never be in the judiciary. So there were women were limited in their um, professional tracks. Hitler in person decided to ban the bar and the judiciary to women. He wanted to establish an all-male order and put women in their place. On September the 13th, 1935, before thousands of young Nazi women gathered in Nuremberg, the Führer hailed his action in favor of gender inequality. The future of German young women and girls seemed mapped out. They would bear children, the only way of being useful to the homeland. Their school study programs and activities were consequently changed. In the BDM, the female branch of the Hitler Youth, 1936 was even declared the year of domestic training. All leisure activities were also intended to prepare them for their role as a mother. They also had to do sport to keep them in good enough health to bear children. To monitor the physical condition of girls and preserve what the Nazis called prenatal potential, BDM leaders called on the few female medical students who were part of the numerous clauses. In Dusseldorf, Hertha Oberhäuser a final year student, signed with enthusiasm. After the war, she affirmed, I was called on by the BDM. I attended sports meets to make sure the girls didn't exert themselves too much. I also gave them regular medical examinations. Hertha Oberhäuser was from a well-off family who had run into financial hardship. She had the typical profile of the young woman who wanted to use the system to get ahead, stand out, and make a career for herself. She became a full-fledged member of the Nazi party. She joined every organization. Her medical studies were a good springboard for Hertha Oberhäuser, allowing her to join the most Nazified of professions at the time. During racial hygiene classes, it was the job of doctors and female students like her to educate young women on how to find the most suitable husband based on so-called racial grounds. Through drawings and slideshows, BDM members were told that the world was divided into hierarchical races and that they belonged to the superior race, the Aryans. At the bottom of the ladder were the Jews, thought of as subhuman. They were taught to recognize Jews from physical stereotypes. 
da ist eben der sogenannte We all know the Nazis anti-Semitic stereotype, the depiction that would allow us to recognize a Jew, a big nose, a hunchback, droopy eyes. That was the belief that went round at the time. On the other hand, there was the blonde-haired, blue-eyed woman, upright, both physically and in attitude and ideology. Uh, ideologisch um, definiert. Das wurde auch als gesund One was considered healthy, und das andere eben while the other was weak and sickly und tüchtig, oder and didn't deserve to have descendants. Uh, sich weiter uh, fortzupflanzen. Some BDM leaders went beyond anti-Semitic indoctrination and embarked their comrades in open provocation. Melita Mashman was 15 at the time. Our leader would often make us march in three ranks and cover part of the distance on the double. We had to stamp our feet as loudly as possible. This is where the rich Jews live, she would say. They need a bit of waking up from their afternoon naps. Since the September 1935 passing of the Nuremberg Laws, which signed a social death sentence for German Jews and prohibited marriages between Aryans and non-Aryans, the police and the SS intensified public haranguing of mixed couples. Aryan women in mixed couples had their heads shaved and were exhibited in public, notably to children. The newspapers ran headlines of the trials, which sent them to jail or later to concentration camps. Their Jewish husbands or lovers would be sentenced to death. as future mothers became the keepers of German blood. They learned the Ten Commandments for finding a husband by heart. Keep your body pure. Examine the genealogy of your fiancé. Strive to have as many children as possible. Amid the excitement of Nazi activist struggles, Liesel Riedel, a young woman from a modest background, chose the path mapped out for German women. She rubbed shoulders with both the rank and file and the rising stars of the party. And that's where she met um, her husband, Gustav, who was really a street fighter, who was described as someone who was a real brute, kind of not barely literate. The novice campaigner was won over by a young man who belonged to the party's elite core, the SS. For Liesel, marrying him would be a way of joining the elite of the regime. But first, she had to obtain permission from the upper echelons of the SS. Her job at the region's most popular Nazi newspaper wasn't enough. Obtaining permission to marry from the SS was a genuine obstacle course. SS men couldn't marry just any woman. She had to be ideologically stable, so there were tests to take. Every prospective couple had to fill out 
reams and reams of paperwork. Now, this included medical certificates to show that you were in good health. Um, you had to include references from people in the Nazi party. You had to show your family tree. And you had to go back many, 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 many generations to show that everybody was good German stock. Liesel had to be examined by an SS doctor. On top of checking her teeth and their state of repair, he noted the dates of her last periods and had her undergo a complete gynecological examination to evaluate whether she would be a good enough progenitor to perpetuate the Aryan race. This complete control of the body was coupled with another requirement. The Third Reich considered the church a political enemy, so Liesel had to renounce her Catholic faith so that her children would be raised with Nazi ideology alone. Her family wanted her to um, observe her Catholic upbringing and get married in a Catholic church and baptize her children. She had a break with her family at that point. A lot of the, the story of how women became, you know, socialized and brought into the movement, there were kind of breaks along the way. In late 1938, after these three years of procedure, the SS officially permitted the wedding of Liesel to Gustav Wilhaus. She gave birth to a daughter in the spring of 1939. Like all newborns, her baby was monitored by the midwives. As public servants appointed by the Third Reich, they had to inform their superiors of any malformations or handicaps. That was immediately registered in the system, um, as well as the vulnerability of that person um, for the rest of his or her life. Um, it would be part of the, the machinery of this, this campaign of what they called a euthanasia. Pauline Kneisler was one of the backbones of this policy, deployed in top secrecy in the spring of 1939. She was involved in the extermination campaign of the physically and mentally handicapped, both adults and children, a campaign which would go down in history as Action T4. She was in her 40s, an experienced nurse and a member of the Nationalist Socialist Women's League and the Nazi Party. A representative from the Chancellery made us swear an oath of secrecy and obedience. Our involvement was entirely voluntary. Those who didn't agree could withdraw. But not one of us expressed the slightest objection to the programme. As part of their training, nurses were taught to no longer show empathy with certain groups of people. This implied the dehumanization of certain patients. Nurses began to see them more as problems than as people who needed to be taken care of or cured, which should be the priority of any health and care establishment. To them, these were people who needed to be kept away from society and then exterminated to prevent them from procreating. Pauline Kneisler and her closest colleagues visited institutions for the handicapped with a list of names of patients to be taken to killing centers. Once they had received their selection orders, they personally took care of those people. They helped them pack their belongings, explaining that they were moving elsewhere. Of course, they never told them the truth. They made up explanations of what was going to happen. And these people were taken to industrial killing centers where they were gassed. In 
It was for Action T4 that the gas chambers were first used. Notably at Grafenek and Hadamar, where Pauline Kneisler was posted. The nurses were so involved that they practically escorted their patients into the changing room next to the gas chamber. Pauline Kneisler also performed lethal injections. She admitted as much after the war. I was never cruel to anybody. We had been told that each creature had the right to a charitable death. Up until the end of the war, almost 200,000 people, children and adults, were exterminated as part of Action T4. This was the first mass murder carried out by the Third Reich, and women played a central part. September the 1st, 1939, German women watched their husbands, brothers and sons go off to war in Poland. They were now called on to leave their homes for a new role. When war broke out, it caused a big change in women's lifestyles. The majority of men were enlisted. The regime found itself torn between upholding its ideology, with women doing their utmost to have children, and necessity. From then on, Germany needed a new workforce to replace the men who had gone to war. Women wouldn't merely take the places of men in the fields and factories of the Reich. They would take an active part in the policy of expansion and colonization of newly conquered lands. Melita Mashman had climbed the ranks of the BDM, the female branch of the Hitler Youth. She was now a leader herself. Like 19,000 of her comrades, she was dispatched to Poland. Melita was brimming with enthusiasm. We believed that now, at last, Germany's historic hour had come to. Our existence at that time was for us like a great adventure. We felt that we had been summoned to take part in a difficult and noble service, by which we believed ourselves to be fulfilling our duty towards the Reich. After a month of fighting, the German army occupied the western part of Poland. The eastern part was controlled by the Soviet Union under Stalin, a result of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Melito was appointed leader of a group which was taking part in the Germanization of a region of western Poland called Warteland by the Third Reich. very quickly clear that Poland was going to be a place in which radical measures were going to be taken, where Nazi power would be able to, as it were, rule without any hindrance. So Poland became, if you like, a sort of laboratory for Nazi colonization um, and Germanization. 
And of course, all this was at the expense of the native Polish population and the Jewish population. SS units evicted them. Melita, impassive, described one of the raids in her memoirs. One morning, we were dragged out of bed for a clean-up operation. The SS officer told me he didn't have enough men to carry it out successfully. At 6 a.m., the wagons had to be ready to leave. Each family was restricted to taking one wagon load of belongings. I heard them protesting sadly and furiously, but I calmly turned my back on them. was given the job of installing, in the homes from which Poles and Jews had been evicted, minorities of Germanic origin from the Baltic states and Romania. These young women were also tasked with teaching these distant Germanic cousins how to become good Germans. Overnight, young, inexperienced women found themselves in positions of authority. There were students who wrote enthusiastic reports about how they felt, I feel like a demigod here in this village. I feel empowered. I am here on the ground. I will give orders. There was, if you like, a cult of political will The Jews that had been evicted by the Nazis were locked up in ghettos. They struggled to survive in inhuman conditions. Notably in the city of Lodz. Some BDM members would visit the ghetto on their days off as if it were a tourist attraction. It was a bit like going to the zoo. Only here it was to see a human population, thought of as exotic, sometimes scary and often scorned. Some women were simply stunned and shocked and I think horrified. But there were others who were, I'm sure, actively anti-Semitic, for whom the spectacle of the Jews crammed together in the ghetto did fuel and confirm prejudices that they had been absorbing already. Melita Mashman, who a few years earlier had had fun stamping her feet to intimidate the Jewish population in Berlin, suppressed all compassion for those suffering the horrors of the ghettos. She was now a supporter of the murderous policy the Third Reich was about to implement. It's atrocious, but the destruction of Jews is a sad fact to which we must become resolved if we want the Vaterland to become German. Nazi policies, tested in Poland since 1939, would suddenly step up a gear early in the summer of 1941 and stretch eastwards. On June the 22nd, Hitler broke the pact that tied him to Stalin and invaded eastern Poland and then the USSR. In the wake of the German army, which was advancing at lightning speed across Soviet territory, almost half a million women crossed the frontiers of the Reich. 
not just members of the BDN and specialists in Germanization went east. They were also secretaries, nurses, and wives of SS officers. Among them was Annette Schuking. Age 21, the brilliant student who wanted to defend human rights saw her position as a legal intern blocked due to the democratic leanings of her family. To earn some points with the regime, she volunteered as a nursing assistant. In the train taking her to Ukraine with her new colleagues, Annette discovered the true nature of the war. At one point, everyone took out their packed breakfast and started eating. And while they were doing so, two soldiers told them they had killed some Jews. With no emotion, coldly, that shocked the four women. The worst thing for my mother was the two soldiers weren't even afraid of being arrested. They were telling this terrible story in front of complete strangers in the compartment with impunity. A war of extermination unfurled in the East. As the German army advanced, Jewish men, women and children were massacred. In Ukraine, on September the 29th and 30th, 1941, more than 33,000 people were shot dead in the Babi Yar ravine near Kyiv by the SS death squads, the Einsatzgruppen. Annette was posted 150 kilometers from Kyiv in the city of Zviahel to run a soldier's hostel. On her arrival, she took some photos. Before the war, more than half the population of the city was Jewish. Now, there reigned a strange atmosphere and an unusual calm. An older officer told her, there are no more Jews in the city. Not a single one. And then he showed her the execution sites. Almost 75,000 people had already been executed in the region since the start of the invasion. The young nursing assistant was plunged into the horror. She wrote to her mother, Dear Mum, if you knew what was going on here, you wouldn't last one day. But I have no idea how to leave this place. I can't find any way out, because you need a very good reason to be sent home. Annette did not betray her feelings. In front of her colleagues and the soldiers, she kept her despair to herself. She didn't trust them. She knew she was surrounded by murderers. People who have no moral inhibitions exude a strange odor. I can now pick out these people, and many of them really do smell like blood. And yet, a few days after Christmas 1941, Annette dared to speak her mind to a non-commissioned officer, Sergeant Frank. He told her he would soon take part in a firing squad. He had volunteered so he could earn a small, rapid promotion. My mother was horrified, horrified that he would openly tell her something like that. In the end, she said to him, please don't do it. You'll never be able to sleep again if you do. When she next saw him, a few days or weeks later, he said, you were right. Annette was intent on keeping a trace of the crime she was unable to prevent. In her diary, she wrote, 
December the 28th, 1941. Sergeant Frank received the order to shoot 6,000 Jews with 20 other men during the coming week. Human lives are no longer worth anything. From then on, she wrote down all the information she was privy to to keep a record of the ongoing crimes. June the 6th, 1942. Last Thursday, 3,000 Jews were rounded up in the night and transported the next morning eight kilometers away and shot by the SS and Ukrainian militiamen. She noted down the numbers of the military postings, wrote her accounts in key words only, the fear of someone discovering her diary. And at one moment, she wrote to her parents, please keep my letters and my photos in a safe place. And I think that gave her strength to get through that period. While these mass executions continued, the occupation authorities set up their headquarters in the conquered territories. And with them came young secretaries who would play a pivotal role in the exploitation of the surviving Jewish populations in the ghettos. In Lida, 19-year-old Lieselotte Meyer assisted the district commissioner, the highest German civilian authority in the city. Far from the small town where she grew up, it was the ideal place to make her hopes a reality. Her daughter, Anna Gret, discovered Lieselotte's past after her death. Having a high status was very important to my mother. She always wanted to rise above her social rank, our social rank. At 20, 22, 24 years old, you still have a lot of dreams. She didn't want to be in a factory job. She was seeking more social mobility, higher pay. The pay was, was better in the East. It was more dangerous there. She must have been someone who wanted a little adventure uh, and had that kind of gumption. These women in their 20s were still unmarried and without children. The world was their oyster. They wanted to build a career, and they saw themselves in some way as pioneers, as precursors. In the Lida ghetto, the district commissioner had set up workshops where Jews were subjected to forced labor. Lieselotte Meyer was in charge of selecting men and women textile workers, carpenters, joiners and mechanics, in good health and aged between 15 and 60. Lieselotte Meyer is a classic example of a secretary placed in the terror. She was responsible for producing those labor ID cards. They were gold. They were, you know, tickets to survival. So as an administrator, she had that power of life and death with that card um, and of selection of, you know, who could be sorted out to be killed, to be shot. In 1942 and 1943, the young secretary was present at meetings where mass executions were organized. Her job was to coordinate with the local police and the SS. On several occasions, she even attended executions. She didn't have the reputation as being a sadistic, kind of very visibly violent person. She was a very efficient administrator and callous to the extent that she didn't care about the fate of the Jews, and that's what makes her an accomplice in my mind.
having become the mistress of her superior, Hermann Hanweg. She not only had access to the safe where he kept valuable items confiscated from Jews, but she also exploited the ghetto workers for her own profit. They strolled through the workshops together, Lizalota and Hermann. Uh, they would just pick out things. It was like a courtship, it was a shopping trip. If they wanted special jewelry, a fur coat, uh, they could order these things at whim. I have these coasters stamped Lida Joinery Workshop. They were clearly made in the ghetto. She used them all her life. For Hermann and, and Lizalot, the Jews constructed a swimming pool at the villa. The Jewish servants treated them uh, with cakes and, and delicacies, you know, what they called post-coital <laughs> treats. I mean, they didn't care, you know, about uh, remain, remaining private, as it were, um, in, in, the, in front of the, the Jewish laborers. She talked about going for sleigh rides. She was very nostalgic about the period. For sure, they were the happiest days of her life. The Jews of the Lido ghetto would be systematically murdered during the next phase of the genocide that was being planned. The final solution. The women of the Reich far from being mere eyewitnesses or accomplices, would play a central, deadly role behind the fences of the camps and within the intimacy of SS families. <laughs> 